Hello, Orca lovers everywhere. I'm Sami Mamarbashi, Communications Director for Global Orcas Partners. Today, I'm here with Steve Byrne, our founder, and we are talking with Michael Weiss, Research Director at the Center of Whale Research. Hello, Michael. Thank you for having a chat with us today. Hi, yeah. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Yeah, hi, Michael. We were just chatting just a little bit before we started the recording and and uh, re reminiscing a little bit about the history and the beginnings back in the, in the 70s and wondered if you could just give us a brief summary of how, how it all got started. Yeah, I mean, the story of how Orca research out here got started, I, I think, is a really interesting a little, and a little bit of a sad one, really, right? I mean, Orca research out here started because of the live capture fishery. Right. You know, they were they were catching orcas in in the Salish Sea, um, mostly southern residents, a few northern residents. Right. Um, but at the time, they didn't know what the, they you know. There wasn't such a thing as a northern resident or a southern resident in right. mind. These folks were doing the thing. They were seeing killer whales every day. So the assumption is that there's thousands of them out there. Um, you know, we're seeing them every day. There must be a bunch of them. So they have this huge live capture fishery. And finally, someone in the Canadian government said, maybe if we're taking all these whales, it'd be a good idea to know how many there actually are. Right, yeah. Um, and and that's kind of how the study um, that Mike Big pioneered kind of got sure. started. Was, you know, let's, let's figure out how they really are, how many there really are. Mike Big figured out that actually, you know, the nicks and scratches that these whales have in their fins are really consistent and their saddle patches are unique. So actually you don't need to do any complicated tagging or anything of the whales. You just need to take pictures and mm -hmm. count how many unique whales you have. And that's how photo ID got started. And then Ken Balcom, who you know eventually founded the Center for Whale Research, started doing the same thing down here in the States. Right, right. And like uh, we all kind of know the ending of that. Well, not the ending, but kind of the punchline of the story is they started doing these photo ID studies and realized, oh, it's not that there's thousands of whales. It's we're seeing the same whales every day. We have resident whales. Right. And right. by the time we figured that out, we've already taken maybe 30 percent of the southern resident population, you know, either directly through captures or indirectly through mortality during the captures. And that's really how it got started is that we needed to count whales. The best way to count whales is to take pictures of them and see how many unique whales you find. And it turns out you can do a whole lot of good, solid science by just taking pictures of whales every year and making sure you keep track of, of who you're seeing. You can figure out social structures, genealogy, population dynamic, all kinds of cool stuff. Right, right. Uh, and, that, and that became the, the model and that's, uh, you know, obviously, there's orcas all, all around the globe. There's orcas every place. And and that's when the scientists start from the North Atlantic and the Southern Hemisphere started coming up to the Sailor Sea and Friday Harbor and, and learning from, from Ken and others what they were doing, what their process was, how to do it, and take that back and teach other people. It became a global model. It was, you know, the photography of the dorsal fin and the saddle, like you said, and then the eye patch came into play. And yeah, but, um, yeah especially for the kids. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. For the, but then, so so that's all taken place. And I think there's a lot, there's a lot, you know, most of our audience knows about the surveys that are happening in their region already. Hmm. But I, um, in doing this a little research before this, uh, this interview, I was reading about your work, which is the aerial, the aerial perspective and drones and how that is, um, adding to the, the the book of knowledge in terms of social um, interactions with whales and that kind of thing. Is that, um, maybe you could give us a little bit of an overview of that. Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, just to start, right? So the reason we started using drones, we started using them back, I think our first field season was 2018. And it really came from this idea that like, you know, everything we know about the Southern residents really, you know, we had, there were a few tagging studies, you know, D-tag stuff starting up. But really everything we knew was from, you know, you're on a boat and you're either watching and taking notes of their behavior, you might be taking video or mostly we're taking still pictures. And that, you get a bunch out of that. I mean, like I said, we went way, people before I, before my time were going way beyond just counting whales with these photos. You can look at, you know, the nice thing is once you can ID whales, you can look at not just who do you photo, but who do you photograph together um, mm -hmm. over time, which helps you assign maternity to you know the new calves helps you track social relationships sure. yeah. 
But ultimately, right, that tells you who's who's together. And I, I like using the metaphor of like a, a big party, right? If I was to go to a party and just say, who's at this party together and do that over and over again at different parties, I might get a pretty good idea of who hangs out together. But I have no idea who's actually, you know, who's dancing together, who's getting <laughs> drinks together, who's actually hanging out. I just know who's at the same party, which is right. useful, but it's not, it's not the whole story. Right. The drone lets us get over the whales and actually look at these groups and say, okay, we know who's here, who's actually coming into contact, who's chasing fish together, who's sharing food, who's surfacing together. So you start getting all this nitty gritty detail um, that lets you go so far beyond just, you know, what the, the match lines, which are, you know, the basic family units, or the pods, which are kind of the next level family units, and actually say, okay, within these groups, oh, J40, you know, J51 and, and J49, they seem like really good friends. That's interesting. Yeah. Why are they such good friends? Um, these two whales, you know, and on the flip side, these two whales might spend all their time together, but never really do anything together. Why is that? Do they have a mutual friend that's kind of drawing them both to the same groups? Yeah. And for me, you know, I'm, I am a scientist, so I'm interested in those kinds of, you know, Blue sky is what we call them. Blue sky questions are just how do killer whale society work? How do their friendships work? Yeah. But ultimately what I'm really interested in as a conservation biologist is what does that mean for their survival and for their yeah, production? Sure. And right. ultimately like, especially in such a small population, right? Population dynamics, extinction or survival is built up of those individual fitness things, you know? how how are these social relationships predicting who survives and who reproduces and what does that mean and how do how do those change over time yeah and, um, and, and the genetic pool too because there's concern yeah. about lack of diversity and and all those things are so not surprisingly actually it makes perfect sense that you're discovering that they're actually making adjustments to maintain some diversity yeah i mean it, it's it's really interesting in the southern residents so their their social structure we've realized even between the Southern and Northerns is totally different, right? The, mm -hmm. the whole pod thing in the Northern residence doesn't seem to exist. It's just really natural lines. Whereas in Southern residence, the pods are important. Right. Um, and what also seems different is those mating patterns. And we'd really hope that the Southern residents would maximize that diversity. Right. But what we found, what, what our colleagues, especially at the Northwest Fishery Science Center who do the genetics work are finding, is actually they're inbreeding a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, the, they're, they're mating within pods, which are kind of extended families. Right. We have at least two cases of mating within matriline. So a, uh, a mother mating with her son um, and producing an, an offspring. And I believe also a that son then mated with, that same male also mated with his sister and produced an offspring. Right. So there's a lot of inbreeding happening and it seems like it is bad for them. So it's a case where, why are they inbreeding when the Northern residents aren't? Well, one answer is smaller population. There's less, mm -hmm. there's, there's a smaller dating pool. Sure. Um, but they don't even seem to be doing the same thing of you know finding someone who sounds different or who's socially very isolated from you to mate with. And I, I wonder if part of that is these differences in social structure and these adaptations they're doing, right? It's a small population, so they're becoming more tight knit and socially yeah. knit. Right. So, you know, again, the, the party metaphor, the parties you're ending up at, you're <laughs> there with a lot of your siblings and your mom, and you know, you're you're, yeah. you're your, your end, yeah, so it's interesting. I, I think there's a lot more work to do in understanding those differences and how their social structure and mating structure might be related to their decline. Their well, for our audience, uh, there, there are three main pods. There's J, J, K, and L pods, right? There's yeah. three main pods. And I think I read someplace that actually J pod, L pod and K pod actually evolved out of J pod. It was just one big pod at one point. I don't know if that's a theory or if that was- if yeah. I correctly. It's it's definitely one of the hypotheses, right? Is that you know the southern residents started as one pod and then they kind of have split over time, um, kind of in the deep deeper past, a few generations back. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, you're right. There's these three pods. L pod is the biggest, and they're kind of really three social groups within L pod at this point. 
there's what we call the 18 L's, which is the main group of L-Pod. Yeah. That's, that's mostly L-Pod. And you have the L12s, which people might be familiar with in your audience if, there's, if they're kind of familiar with the Tokate. That's where L25 okay, sure. is, yeah. who, who we know has been photographed. Right. Who, who was photographed in that group um, that to during the capture that Tokate was taken what, in. What's, what's her, um, her mother's name? His son? Um, we, Ocean we, son or something? We don't know. I don't think we don't know for sure who her mother is, but we know that L25 Ocean Sun was photographed uh, in that group on that day. So it's quite possible. You know, we don't know who Ma is necessarily, but it's quite possible she is an L12, right? right. An L12 male and an L12 specifically. So yeah, you you can see these these match lines here. <laughs> yeah, and you and just you know, a plug for your website. Your website is wonderful. You've got so yeah. much information there. It's very graphic and easy to look at. And what I'm looking at behind you looks like what's on your website as well. Yeah, yeah. So like these these match lines. That's the L12. That's the kind of 18 Ls. Okay. Then you the last group, the L54s. <laughs> okay. Um, right. There's just there's just four of them and. Right. They're, they're kind of a dead end, unfortunately, because it's one post-reproductive female who's not reproducing, and then three males. So that match line's a, a dead end, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's interesting. I mean, uh, I guess it's not 100% out of the picture. There, there couldn't be a new a new pot that could form out of it, but it doesn't seem very likely based on what's happened. The opposite is happening. They're shrinking rather than adding. Yeah, especially so... You know, J-Pod's doing pretty well. Um, they haven't had any deaths in the last few years, and they've had a bunch of kids. Um, K-Pod, K and L-Pod are, are doing less well. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, we don't know how pods form, right? Because even with, you know, now almost 50 years of data collection, mm -hmm. we still haven't been following them for enough generations to see how these pods kind of split or reform, right? In the entire time we've been watching the study, we haven't really seen a, a new pod. You know, I, I think I think there's an argument to be made that, you know, with a few more generations, maybe the L12s will be a, a proper separate pod. And in fact, when the study started, they briefly were called M-Pod. Uh, okay. They, there was a thought where they, they were separate enough that they were maybe going to be M-Pod. But it turned, you know, after a while, it became clear they were pretty, they were closely associated with the other L's. One of the big things that defines the pods is their um, their vocal uh, repertoires. They sound right. different. The different pods right. sound different. That's the and dialect work that uh, John Ford started, and I mean, that's continuing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. John Ford cataloged the calls for the northerns and the southern residents. Right. Those dialects. They have changed over time, but they're pretty they're pretty stable. They're at least stable in the fact that they're different. Um, um, and the L12s do have their own kind of dialect, but they have a lot of L-pod dialect as well. So. Is that a part of your, your research too, is to do the recordings, the, the audio recordings, and, and record those dialects and analyze them? We, at the center, we're not currently doing a ton of acoustic work. Um, mm -hmm. Monica Whelan Shields at Orca Behavior oh, yeah. Institute does a lot of that. Um, we're hoping in the coming years we have a few kind of funding pitches that are out in the ether right now that we're hoping will um, help us kind of bridge the gap between the you know detailed drone behavior data and the acoustics. So kind right. of say you know what are they doing and what are they saying, right, and, right, right. and try to match those things up. Um, so the, the folks at Orca Month, they had a, a presentation, and when, I can't forget the scientist's name, but they were talking about they can identify, um, I don't know if it was the pod or the clan, by, by not individuals yet, but yeah. the, the clans maybe, just by audio. And I, yeah. everybody's talking about AI and ML and, you know, and edge computing and all this stuff that it's, we're not there yet, but we're going to be in the next 10 years, and it's going to be a big tool for you and your, your colleagues. Yeah. Um, and and pattern recognition and playback and all that. Um, well, I'm, I'm getting off the subject. So, so you no, do fine. you do some audio, um, or you did do some audio, but you're currently that's you're focused more on the um, the I guess the drone video to show the so, social structures and social relationships. Yeah, yeah, social relationships. There's really two kind of classes of, of behavior we're interested in. One is the social stuff and the other is foraging, right? I mean, right, right. ultimately, 
if we're interested in how does social behavior impact survival, a lot of it's going to come down to how do your social relationships help you get food for the Southern residents? Because that's right. their main thing is, right. is right. They're, they're really food limited. So we are really interested and we've had some good success in getting footage both of, you know, how whales hunt together. So how they work together to catch salmon and also how they share salmon after they've caught it. Um, and, you know, that, that's slow work because unfortunately, you know, it's hard to get that footage because they're not catching fish very often. Right. Um, but when you get it, it is, it's some of the, the coolest stuff to watch is these whales work in fish together. So, and you know, the other thing I saw, I read about was the, um, is it's hard for them to find where the, where the fish are. Mm. You know, it'd, be, it'd be great if the drones could, you know, fly over and find that and say, hey, they're over here. But Yeah, give them a marker or something. Yeah. But that's not happening. But no. Um, but is it, you know, that's, is that's also part of your work. You're able to be above so you can kind of see where the fish are, but, but how do, I guess the question is, how do the whales find that the fish? Great question. So I think, I think there's kind of two scales at which they find the fish. Um, one is finding the right area, given the conditions and the time of year where, you know, these, so Chinook, the fish they like to eat, Chinook salmon oh. tend to live, tend to spend their time pretty close to the bottom. Um, in deep water, and they tend to be kind of clumped. You tend to find, it's not you know one or two fish, you tend to find patches of them. Right. So I think one thing they need to do is just get to the area where they're likely to encounter a period. And the way they do that really is relying on the knowledge of those old females. Um, it's okay. the old females who know the right places to hunt, who take the lead in these foraging groups. Right. And we've actually found that they take the lead more in years where there's less food around. So when it's harder to find food, you're more reliant on grandma. You need you need grandma to show you where the food is and when, when food's scarce. Uh -huh. So that's kind of the, the top level is just getting to the right area. Once they're there, um, you basically, if you if whales are foraging, you'll see them spread out, you know, in twos and threes, little subgroups. Males, adult males will be way offshore. Yeah. They'll basically spread out in a line. And it... You know, we don't know exactly what they're doing. It looks a lot like a drive fish, a drive <laughs> fishery, right? They're moving up the strait. And while they're doing that, they're echolocating. And we've yeah. seen them from the drone. They're actually kind of orienting downwards. They're at the surface. They're pointing their melon down. And they're click, 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 click. Yeah, just yeah. Waiting, to, waiting to find a bunch of fish. Once they find it, they'll dive. Um, if they're with other whales, they might dive together. Although what I've seen a lot of is one whale diving pushing, you know, chasing the fish towards the surface where there's other younger whales usually waiting. Right. And then they'll work together to just tire the fish out at the surface. Right. Um, just keep keep it from diving, keep it from getting away. And once it's tired, the the oldest female in the group will come in and, and grab it. So well, they have a, they have a, there is a structure and a system. So it sounds almost mathematical or grid-like and but they're communicating, they're in constant communication as they're doing yeah. it. And it's sort of I imagine it's evolved and maybe it changes under different conditions? Absolutely. I mean, it's something we want to look at. One of the things, one of the reasons to bring in, you know, the acoustics potentially with the drone is we are really interested in, you know, what how, are they signaling to each other when they find some yeah. fish? How are they doing that? Do yeah. some animals do it more than others? You know, do, is a female more likely to call someone over to where her fish are than a male? Um, we don't know. These are questions we don't really know. We do know from, you know, way back, say way back in the 90s there were studies on foraging and we know when they it seems that when they find some fish to chase those subgroups i was talking about that are kind of spread out seem to, to come together they seem mm -hmm. to reduce the distance between them mm -hmm. so we don't have the acoustic data to pair with that but somehow if one group's finding a patch of fish the other group is knowing to kind of come over that way so whether they, they might be eavesdropping, right? They could just be listening for the clicks that mean they're chasing fish. Or what I think is maybe more likely is whoever found the fish is making calls. That mean there's fish here. Come over here, there's fish. Um, yeah, but which goes back to sharing. Instead of being selfish and want to hog it themselves, they share yeah. it. And it kind of goes back to your, your party metaphor because it's almost like when there's fish, it's an excuse for different groups to come together and there's more socialization during those events absolutely absolutely so and we actually have studied that quantitatively like we 
you know, talking about those um, associations. So who's in the same group together, the party, you know, how big is the party, who's at the party together? We can look at those social networks every year, year by year by year, and compare it with measures of how many fish there were in that year. And we find in those years where there's more fish, that network gets way more connected. <laughs> it's exactly what you're saying. When there's more fish around, you can have bigger parties. Yeah, um, sure. You can you can hang out with with whales you wouldn't normally hang out with. Um, it's yeah, it's exactly what you're saying. Um, and and that that's all just from the photo ID data, right? That's purely yeah. just from going out and taking pictures of groups of whales. We can we can and, measure and that. Having aerial video, which is adding to that knowledge. And then another thing that caught my attention when I was reading is the um, you called it the edge, and it's like these these little subtle areas, like like orcas that physically touch, how often they touch. So can yeah. you talk a little bit about what that, you know, it, obviously that indicates bonding, but we can talk a little bit more about that too. Yeah. So on a very like high level, when we're studying animal social relationships. So if you think about how a sociologist or an anthropologist might study human social networks, right. you'd probably go out and ask, you know, you'd interview someone and say, who's your friend? How often do you hang out? You know, what kind of relationship do you have? And then you can build this network. Unfortunately, I can't go out and interview a killer whale about who their friends yeah. are. Not <laughs> yet. Maybe soon, but not yet. Yeah. All I can do right now is, through various ways, watch what they do. Right. So when we're building animal social networks, we identify behaviors that seem to be kind of pro-social, kind of seem to be you know friendly, uh, signify bonding, as you say. And essentially, just measure the rate at which they do that with each other, with the, the assumption being the more often you do those behaviors, the stronger your social relationship. Um, and so in cetaceans, so in, in killer whales and dolphins, um, the physical touch seems to be really, really important. They have a ton of nerves in, you know, all over the body, especially their, their rostrum. Um, you see it a lot between moms and their calves. They're just constantly rubbing on each other. Um, in the killer whales and the residents, what we found is that, you know, yes, moms and calves do that constantly, but that behavior keeps going into adulthood, right? You, you keep having friends that you are just, you'll take time out of foraging to just get up next to each other and just have a, have a cuddle, really, have a, have a little <laughs> hug. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and it seems sometimes it almost looks like they're scratching each other on, you know, on each other, kind of scratching an itch. Other times they're just laying on the surface, one on the other. Um, we think that it, essentially the reason you do it um, is that it, we think that the main thing it does for them is reinforce those social bonds. Yeah, yeah. We're really interested going forward in looking at how that predicts things that are important for survival. So if you, are bonding a lot through touch, are you more likely to help each other out to catch a fish? Are you more likely to share fish you catch with each other? Right. Um, you know, are there things that, you know, so, you know, you, you do that first step, this behavior helps you build a bond. The next obvious question to me at least is, why do you want to build that bond? And there's a bunch of reasons we think killer whales want to build that bond, but we, we want to test it empirically. Well, it's kind of analogous. I'm thinking of Jane Goodall and her work with the chimpanzees, and they're constantly grooming each other. Yeah. And it seems, you know, it's it's kind of seems like a, a kind of a natural thing from high level mammals. Of yeah. Anything. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to go real deep um, into our evolutionary past. This kind of desire for touch, the the neural circuits kind of associated with it, the oxytocin release you get from physical touch with social partners is something you see in most mammals, um, mm -hmm. even mammals that aren't social, with the right drugs, you can make them social and it's the same pathway. <laughs> We're just like it's, people. <laughs> it goes back, it might even go deeper than that. Um, so there, this is getting pretty far off topic, but I think it's relevant. Yeah, that's right, good, go for it. There's a study in octopus, um, mm -hmm. so a social octopus. These octopus are not social animals at all. If they see mm -hmm. another individual, they fight. If you give them MDMA uh, ecstasy, they become social, just like humans do. They, they start touching each other. Now that's a really funny, fun experiment, but it also, I think, says something really fundamental, which is that this, these circuits, the brain circuitry, the chemical reactions that 
relate to these reward pathways around social touch are go back so deep, yeah, so so that. deep, sure. yeah, to the to the like beginning of animals. So you you start looking at killer whales and you know why are they touching? What is that doing for them? It's like ah, oh, it's doing the same thing it does for every other animal. Yeah. It's making them yeah. feel nice about each other, building that bond. Right, right. Um, yeah. So another, you know, just kind of, I'll just switch gears a little bit here, just because, you know, um, we were talking just before we started recording, and you had to, uh, you had an opportunity to go out and try to do a drone uh, flight today, and the wind, the wind came up. But yeah. I think people are interested in your, I want to say your typical days, but it, over a week or over a month's period of time, you have different kinds of situations. What, um, yeah, like, like I have a, my, I have a, a friend who's our, our video production a manager mm. for our, our um, group, and he's a drone pilot. And he teaches drone yeah. photography um, at community colleges. Cool. And he was on a shoot in the back bay of uh, Newport, and um, they lost the drone into the water. Oh <laughs> no! The card. They lost the drone. The guy dove down to try to find it, couldn't oh, find no. it. No. So I'm just thinking, you know, stuff like that. I mean, do you is is you have any recent stories about things that happen out in the field and with men uh, and drones? Knock on wood, we have not lost a drone yet. Well, that's great. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a typical day, right, is we're sitting in this office doing whatever, you know, catching up on data entry, doing analysis, answering emails, office stuff. Right. We have a radio on. We have our our, our fleet radio on where we're right. uh, in touch with um, folks who are doing spotting, so whale watch guides, that kind of thing. And we have other ways of getting sightings reports. If we get a sightings report that seems like something we could we should do so whales that are within our study area the conditions seem okay and um it's a group that we'd want to work um we will kind of rally the troops get all of our equipment together drive to our boat which is just you know five minutes up the road um and go and depending on a few different factors we will either have a day that is kind of a dedicated photo id day where we'll do drone stuff if we have time or if it's a group that we've done good photo ID on, we don't need new pictures, we've confirmed who's there and what they all look like, we might just say, we're gonna go and we're gonna fly the drone. We're gonna collect behavior data. Um, and yeah, we're we're pretty careful and maybe even overly cautious, but I, I'd rather I'd rather err on the side of caution about the conditions <laughs> we fly the drone in. Yeah, you know? definitely, definitely. So you don't fly, yeah. yeah. Go ahead and finish it. I was just going to say, we don't fly, you know, in both Bofer, in Beaufort three or higher. So we don't do white caps. We don't fly okay. if there's white caps. We don't fly if there's, if there's significant wind of any kind. Right. Um, right. We just, we want calm, clear, easy days if we can get them. Yeah. And you launch right from the boat, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we have a little Phantom 4, which is kind of your classic, you know, white drone with the little runner legs. So we DJI. have... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we've got a, uh, we've got someone wearing a helmet and glasses and gloves holding the drone over their head oh, like this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we have a pilot who launches it and then, you know, get 20 minutes or so of flight time. And then we come back, do the same thing in reverse to catch it, yeah. um, change a battery out, go back up. And we do that um, as long as we can, really, as long as we can work the conditions are right and the whale's behavior is is conducive to it. Yeah, and the bat well, the batteries go for what nine, 90 minutes or something or 60 minutes? Not, not that long. Ours ours go for 20 usually is what we could get, we can get we can theoretically get half an hour out of them if you're not moving much, but yeah. whales are whales. Yeah. So yeah. we end up moving quite a bit. So we get about 20 minutes out of them. We you take have three or three or four of them batteries or something like that. Yeah. Oh uh, no, we have um I think we have 30. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. So you could be up all day then if you wanted to. If, if we you needed know. to, yeah. So we we try to limit the amount of time we kind of spend over any particular whale to about two hours a day. Right. Um, we've never seen any reaction of the whales to the drone, but we try, yeah. you know, just in case, precautionary. But, you know, with especially with T's, with the transient killer whales, right. they have such long down times right. between their kind of surface periods that you know, in 20 minutes of flight time, you might only have five minutes above the whale. Right. Um, and you're pretty just waiting. Yeah. How high, how much, how, how high are you above the whale? Um, Mac, a minimum of a hundred feet above the whale. Oh, yeah. Usually, so usually, 
Yeah, they're yeah. not going to lose anything. No, we've never seen them. The most we've seen is on a really clear day, a really clear still day. We've seen whales maybe turn on their side to look at it, yeah. and then they just go back to what they were doing. Um, we've never seen them avoid it or change their behavior or anything um, related to the drone. The well, other again, knock on wood. I'm sure that, you know, they're so smart. They probably know they're not birds. They don't know what they are, but they know they're not birds. Yeah, exactly. Like they, you know, but on the other, on the other flip side, like these are really urban whales. They, they yeah. see aircraft all the time. Yeah. Like they yeah. see helicopters yeah. and planes. And these days they see drones all the time. Yeah. So I think there might've been an initial curiosity, but I think at this point it's just, ah, the drones back up if they notice it at all. Right. Um, so that's a lot of footage. Um, and I imagine you, you, you know, you don't have any, uh, you have to go through it manually, correctly. You have to kind of go through it and see what's useful and what isn't. Well, I've developed a very, um, a, a very high tech method for easily analyzing drone video, which is get students to do it. <laughs> um, so train students how to ID whales and how to identify behaviors and have them do all the analysis once you're satisfied that they're doing it correctly. You have as many students as you do batteries. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> Man, that'd be great. That'd be great. Um, yeah, we're so we're definitely interested in working on you know computer vision ways to analyze the data, yeah. Um, yeah. At, at least for some questions, especially yeah. around configuration and stuff. We haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, the real difficulty is the background is so variable and the angle you're looking at the whales is often variable. Mm -hmm. It's stuff we're sure machine vision can do. We just mm -hmm. haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, so currently, yeah, we any question we want to answer, we have to figure out a way that we can do it by hand. Mm -hmm. um, just watching the video and coding things we see or marking individuals' positions in the video yeah. um, and, and building up a data set. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's still, it's still, yeah, not not old school. We're still, you know, <laughs> fully in the digital age, but not automated yet. Yes, you know, three to five years, you'll have all kinds of things that'll speed that up, and make it easier. I, I cannot wait. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. So, what part do you play when you do you fly the video? I mean, fly the drones yourself? Um, it depends. So, um, usually, I'll be the one actually flying. Mm -hmm. um, I I'm the I'm the only person based on San Juan Island right now who's a um, on the permit as a as a pilot. Okay. Um, now piloting command for drone stuff uh, doesn't mean you necessarily have to be working the controls. You just have to be overseeing the flight and have right. the ability to take control. So we've had PhD students working with us who we wanted to train up, you know, right. give them the training to how to operate drones. So in that case, I'll be the pilot in command, but someone else will operate. Right. The, and, the, then you the have spot, and you have spotters, which are, that's a whole different category. Yeah. We have visual observers. So they're helping the pilot maintain visual line of sight on the drone. You have people spotting the whales as well. So you have people watching the drone, people watching the whales, people watching the video screen, and then potentially me watching the person watching the video screen. Um, but almost always, yeah, when we're doing drone work, I'll be, I'll be actually flying and we'll have someone else driving the boat. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I gotta say, I, I'm not, you know, in this line of work, I'm not a person who gets seasick easily, but in, in some swells, if your if you're <laughs> head's down on a video yeah, screen I like can this, imagine. It, yeah. it can get you, yeah. Yeah, you know, I can see how that that would it'd be like having some funny glasses on or something. You got the, all those opticals. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's a bit of a trip. But it is, I mean, on a nice day, it's great because you're, you know, you're having to stick, kit, maintain situational awareness. So you are watching the whales from the side. Um, and then you can, you're glancing down at your screen and you're seeing, you know, so you really get this idea of like, oh, I'm seeing, you know, a second of each whale and then right. looking down and seeing all the things they're doing out of sight uh, is really, really cool. Well, that's cool. That's cool, Michael. I really appreciate, you know, I think um, maybe we, want, we might want to just uh, wind this one down. You've yep. given us a lot of information. I really appreciate it. You've had a long day already. But we'll, no, leave, some, great. we'll see, leave some discussion for the next one. And then I'm yeah. sure we'll have uh, hopefully many of these kinds of, um, of, of discussions with you. But I appreciate it very much. And I guess we'll have uh, Sammy close out this recording. If you could just stay on for a minute, we'll just have a little We'll talk after after he stops the recording. But thanks very much, Michael. Very much appreciated. Oh, thank you for having me. This has been great. Good. Glad you liked it. Thank you.